be the trail camera. It is time to be the trail camera, everybody. The time is now. Full moon's here, the 28th, this Saturday. Cold, fr cold front moving in, going to hit Illinois in the Midwest. Temperatures are going to plummet in the morning. These deer are going to be on their feet searching, and we just watched tonight a big deer walk out into the food plot, 40 yards, perfectly broadside and feed for 12 minutes. We're about ready to tell you about that right here on Chris Brackett's Land Life, and they didn't take a picture, so you have to be the trail camera. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining us. This is episode four. This is where we're going to talk about what's happening, what's going on right now live in the field. We're going to report to you from Illinois on our big lease, on my private farms, on a, on a few other people's farms around us, my clients. I sell land for a living in Illinois. I'm a licensed broker with Herman Brothers Realty. It's what I love, the land life. Land life has everything to do with uh, fish and developing ponds and developing land and planting native grasses and figuring out how to bring these deer out from where they live doing deer stuff they're doing deer stuff in the woods they're doing deer stuff on the outskirts of these fields they're eating acorns they're eating corn they're eating soybeans especially in the midwest you got your greens your turnips your clovers your alfalfas those are all the things that we do to make sure that our farms are perfect and we can I can sell you a farm. I can develop a farm. I do consoles, boots on the ground, on online, over the internet, where I uh, go to Whitetail Land Life, which is a company I own, where I go on and I consult over, over, uh, you know, over the internet, where I can control your screen. We can go on Onyx, one of the apps that I find that I use. Um, I pay for it. It's really great to show where the winds are and how the winds are moving and the topography and it shows topography lines. And uh, I don't get anything from them. I'm just telling you that's what I use. So if we're going to talk or if you don't ever want to send me something, that's where you share that on Onyx where it's got like waypoints and things like that. But right now, guys, it is time to be the trail camera. And what do you mean by that, Chris? Well, we know that in the past week, we have been anticipating anticipating the deer arrival like the buck arrival because they go into well some people would call it a uh october lull now i don't really believe in an october lull i believe in the weather and being uh, a, a good condition for big animals wearing fur coats and a lot of fat and a lot of muscle to be moving i'm going to pick weather over anything else uh, that you ever want to talk about pre-rut, rut, late season, whatever. If you get the weather, you're going to have white-tailed deer moving. Right now, it is, got to wrote down here so I didn't forget, it's October 25th because all the days run into each other when the when you get uh, wound up like this and as we're going into this, uh, really, our deer season. This is deer camp for us. Anywhere between October 25th uh, on through to about Thanksgiving is when all of us, I believe, across the country, we get fired up. We kiss the women goodbye and we go out hunting and we're wanting to watch, watch these whitetails do deer stuff. So um, today, uh, Kirk got into town. He's sitting here with me. And we have this one spot that we have been really working on and how we're going to, you know, utilize stands and blinds and things like that. And we dropped a 360 in about, uh, next to these soybeans. And I think if you guys are following me online, I posted some pictures on there. If you're not, uh, we're on Instagram, Chris Brackett's Land Life. Uh, we're on Facebook. But if you're following that, you saw some pictures of setting up this new 360. And we got a funny story about how the new window systems work. Now, Kirk bought the 360. Like we, we're not, we don't want to sponsor, but it really is working great in this location. It's on an eight foot platform. It rolls a little bit where you can get in it, and we know that this one, one good deer is in there and and wanted to at least lay eyes on him. And today, what you had? How long were you there? An hour, and it was just beautiful. Yeah, no more than an hour. Yeah, so no more than an hour. That that buck walks out, and big nine pointer, four and a half years old. Big nine pointer. Yep. So he's standing there, four and a half year old, broadside for uh, how long did you say? Probably fifteen minutes. Yeah, fifteen minutes. Came out and fed in the beans a little while. And we've got we've got a trail camera right in this little corner, right where these beans come out, and it comes out of it's it's a really great, you know, kind of that place you would picture whitetails coming out. You've got a timber edge, you've got a soft edge using 
big blue and native grasses and there's some you know weeds and and just other things in there it's like tall stuff cover so a deer can come out of that big hardwood timber come out to a soft edge and then kind of come out into the food and and this just happens to be uh i put a little winter wheat strip in there but really it's standing soybeans so you got a picture we've got the wind we got a south wind we've got a big block of timber we've got this soft edge that's probably about i don't know 20 feet wide of these grasses and these big blue stem native grasses five six foot tall there's a, we got a trail camera there and in this corner where the soft edge is that's where all the deer want to come out so there's a cell camera sitting in the beans pointed toward the timber down the way and this deer walks out feeds there for 15 minutes broadside everything's perfect he's just a little young we think he's four and a half years old and that deer never one time gets his picture taken not one time in 15 minutes of being there here's this shooter in a lot of places you know deer standing there doing what he's supposed to and never gets a trail camera so that's why we're trying to give you a little bit of advice here that to go be the trail camera and what does that mean trail camera uh cellular whether it be on a tree whatever you're trying to collect information of what the white tail are doing uh and and you're just trying to catch a picture i mean if you can catch an if you can catch the pictures of the white tail doing what what they're doing whether to hit and scrape or moving or coming to a food plot you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be able to take that intel you're going to be able to move in uh whether you're waiting for this rainy day to go in and pull uh non-cell cam cameras get that intel break it down and start putting together a plan together uh, start putting together a plan to go in after this deer well this was a perfect instance where right now you are going to know your good spots you're going to know where you've done the work you where you've put the food plots in you're going to you know have these good wins with these bulletproof setups and your stands and everything perfect but what i'm trying to tell you is don't rely on trail cameras to tell you to invade or to go or to notify you that these deer are here at this time of year on october 25th all the way through to thanksgiving you're going to be getting consistent winds tonight was a south wind with a little bit of east in it but normally when it's an east wind it's very unstable but with the front that's coming it was sucking into the system coming out of that northwest and so it's sucking into a front and as as the storm's coming through it needs to suck this air across illinois to meet up in iowa or north dakota and then that front will will start rolling in what they call you know rolling in picture a storm waves rolling in and that's exactly what's going down so with this consistent wind blowing out of the southeast we were able to set up on the south side deer walked out never got a trail cam picture our trail cameras we're probably running 20 something on one farm yeah right around 20. okay yep. and then on my farm i have 10 over there so we're looking at 30 on any given day we have non-cellular cameras that are out there collecting data and collecting fun videos on scrapes and stuff and and then if you just just our friends just our other farms our other states what's going on there's probably another 20 30 40 that we're we're getting intel from right yep and so the last three days have by, been by far the least amount of deer movement in general does bucks even at night but every once in a while that big deer will show up and that just happened in the last couple of days so if we're writing down in a journal of what's happening right now this is kind of why we're doing the show is to, we're letting you know that the 25th the 26th the 27th 28th these are the days when you need to be anticipating the next move on that deer if you're in business, if you're in anything, you know, where you're being strategic, you already know about strategizing. So this is just like a wake up call. I'm not saying you don't already know this, but I'm just letting you know that now is the time to flip those switches, activate, 
get that little extra time away from the family, away from work, and go ahead and get in the field because you're going to want to spend time as long as that wind's consistent because these deer are showing up. Last night we had a deer show up, or about two days ago we had a deer show up. Uh, last night he was on a scrape uh, in that horrible poor weather and he was walking around at 4 30 in the afternoon in the timber hitting scrapes this is a four and a half year old deer that probably scores close to 170 he's probably 160 something inch deer and he's a four-year-old he's an he's a super stud uh we're going to talk about him in a second his name is dave but dave has not been to this entire hillside probably about a five acre little hillside that's at the very tip of this ridge. And we have cameras on both sides. And like, if you're a big buck and you're walking through this, you're, you're going to go, you're going to pick the North side of the South side of this ridge. and You're going to walk down. You're not going to come by there without hitting one of these scrapes. And Dave hasn't been there for what we know all summer, but we put trail cameras out in, in September all fall. Dave hasn't been there one time. But he knew about the place because he was there all last year. He was there and then on this alfalfa plot we have. And he would go back and forth about a half mile away. And so he showed up yesterday for the first time. And if we would have been hunting him, we would have killed him. And so that's what I'm trying to say is that you really need to just go park yourself in your good spots, knowing that what happened 365 days uh in the past last year. And if you don't, and, and if you don't remember what happened, go through your trail cameras. That's a great way to find what Intel that's, that's the number one way that we find is we either, we go back through what things we saved and what we're looking for. So one, you're going to go back and look at trail cam pictures and figure out where these deer are. The number one way to shoot a four five, six, seven, eight year old mature whitetail buck is to know what he did 365 days uh, earlier and he will either do it exactly the same or he will be in the same area. It's just their pattern. It's what they do. It's what they look forward to. It's what they're anticipating. And, uh, and that's, that, that's just one of the greatest little tricks, one of the greatest things to put, you know, that in your favor. You know, we didn't come up with that. It is a jury thing. It is a, every big buck killer on the planet knows that once they kind of figure out what that four-year-old did, and he's still alive, he's going to do it as a five-year-old. And so just like tonight, as we're setting up for this podcast, we've been looking for a deer named Descendant that our buddy named, um, this deer is a giant. Last year, he was beautiful. We didn't actually target him, and we kind of just kind of let him slide. I really don't know why we let him slide, but we were after some some really unique deer that we had a uh, little more history with, and this big deer was on this one side of the farm, and we left him completely alone. We found his antler. Uh, we found his shed, and he blew up into something that is just, I, I, would, I would put it as hardy. He is a very hardy deer. He's a very hardy deer. It, did he look like he missed a meal all year? No, he ate everything in sight. He ate everything that we left for him last year, and he is probably one of the fattest deer I've ever seen. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that this deer is gonna go 265, 275, on the hoof, laying there dead. Everything we're gonna take to get him in the back, like we're gonna get him killed. He's the deer that if you were watching me live on the Chris Brackett land life page on facebook i was live last night was it last night night before two nights ago i, I don't know that's why we write down the date because i don't even know what day it is but i think i was there two nights ago and i snort wheezed in this big buck and i filmed it all and i was there hunting this other big deer um the, the there's two of them right there and and they're all going to hit this i know i'm confusing everybody but it's just one section and this big deer came in. I filmed it on uh, Facebook and this, this deer that came in, why didn't I shoot him? He's just, he, he wasn't fancy enough for me, I guess. Uh, but the big deer that we're after descended, I talk about it in the video that in the next five days, this big deer descendant is going to show up. He's six or seven years old. He's super massive. He's large and in charge. And he was on this plot. Kirk sent me the picture this morning on October 25th of last year. He was on the same plot that I was hunting or that we got his picture tonight. 
and the same plot I was hunting two days ago. And I guaranteed that buck would show up on that plot within the next five days. And it only took two. And he is in there chasing does, checking those does, finding out who's going to be the first in estrus. And, you know, maybe making some scrapes, maybe fighting some of these other deer, uh, but really just going into these areas. And this is why you have to be the trail camera. So let me recap the last 10 minutes of me just blabbering and going around in circles. Be the trail camera because the deer are going to show up where they did last year, the ones that are alive. And the ones that aren't alive uh, that you like maybe don't, you know, that you don't know about, uh, maybe one that you don't know about will show up. The other ones are gone, but these are the areas that they want to be at this time of year. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Right. Like, what can you add to that? Like you're finding, you're finding this out by hunting the Midwest with me a little more strategic than just having your own farm and kind of coming from PA and just jumping around these farms. You're, you're now, you now have a, a true strategy and picking apart at the outside you know, hunting them super bulletproof, watching them and then figuring out, okay, this deer did this 365 days ago. He's going to do it, whether it's on the day or within a couple days, depending on the weather, if the daylights or not. Right. Yeah. And, and that's something that I would have never thought before, you know, uh, you guys showing me that, uh, that, you know, and that's happened twice in the last two days uh, yeah. with, uh, with Dave and with the descendant. They were both uh, last year. We knew where they were, and they showed up within an acre or two, just in, in two days. Yeah, and the, I mean, within an acre or two. I mean, that how, you know, that's two football fields, right? I mean, like they were there a year ago, and then all of a sudden they're back. And and I think that's why the everybody that's listening to this, go be the trail camera. You know it. I don't think people give themselves enough confidence. Like you're doing the work. You got the trail cameras doesn't matter what quality they are you have the pictures from last year go look go pay attention to those pictures go back to those areas and the deer that are still alive they're going to be back and they're going to be bigger i mean it's that simple and it's not science and i'm not saying that i know everything but i can tell you that my job right now is to talk to you and try to put all the odds in your favor so these areas that you know what these deer are doing go get them go get them it's time full moon Saturday, right? Yep, this Saturday. I mean, I may be a little nuts, but 24 hours, 48 hours for that full moon. I mean, if you look at every trail camera over the last five years. Yeah, it's going to be fire. They're, they have to walk. I don't know why. I think they're vampires. I don't really know why. I think they're monsters. Uh, I've, I've actually even, you know. I've got a monster voice for that. I mean. We're talking like monsters, they're vampires, man, and they're going to come out in the full moon. That was my monster voice, guys. So full moon, the 28th, Saturday, uh, go hunt. I don't care if you have to give your wife money and let her go take the kids out for a nice dinner or whatever, but uh, let her have her let you go hunt. All right, so Dave is something that has been a big topic, right? So why is he named Dave? Well, that's because we had like four deer that had splits on their G2s and G3s, and one was Cheech. He killed it last year. Chong was the other one, and then he's like, what's this deer? Is this deer Chong? And I think we just got into laughing, and I'm like, is, is it Chong, or is it Cheech, or is it Dave? Or like, what, what's his name? And I'm like, I don't know, but Dave's pretty funny. So this deer became Dave, and he was a super monster three-year-old. And if Dave walked past me once, he walked past me 30 times while I was hunting Wolverine. I mean, in the woods, in the field, back and forth. I think one time he was running over here by my truck and like in the middle of the day, he was running down the neighbors. Uh, he literally was everywhere and was probably a 150 inch deer last year at three and a half years old. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just a pretty deer, just a real pretty deer. Fancy. That's where we're getting at right now is fancy. So the question of the day is, uh, Dave is a perfect example, but what is our goal? Is it age over score? And how fun is this topic? Because if anybody knows about me, they know that I love to kill old deer. But I passed one up two days ago that might have been the oldest deer on the farm. 
Why didn't I shoot that deer? Well, because I wanted a fancy one. He wasn't really fancy enough for me. He probably scored 125 inches, looked like he had Swarber's baseball bats on his head and didn't have many points. But Dave is a four and a half year old that scores 157 to 165, probably. Yeah, I would say maybe better. He's pushing 165. He's got to be close. <laughs> so, I mean, that, so that's a deer that when Kirk saw it and I saw it were just awestruck. Big, beautiful deer. If I'm on YouTube here, I'm going to probably throw the picture on. You guys can check them out. Dave's incredible. Um, but I asked Kirk, like, would I didn't, I actually didn't have to ask him, but you would 1000% shoot Dave, right? Absolutely. Four and a half year old. Every time. But what about the goal of shooting mature deer? And half the people across the country are going to shoot every four-year-old they see, and I get it. Now, we had this discussion earlier, which is when you're talking about a big deer, are you talking about an old deer? Or are you just knowing that when they get old, they're going to be big? Because I think every one of us, the goal that we were talking about today is if we can grow 160-incher by the year, the, by its and it'd be two years old, right. it's like killing a two-year-old turkey. They still got an 11-inch beard. Yeah. They're still running around gobbling their head off. <laughs> I mean, I will kill a two-year-old turkey all day long. And if I think if big whitetails were two years old and they had 160-inch racks, wouldn't it would be the most fun on the planet. So DNR, if you're listening, go get a bunch of braider does from all these guys growing 400-inch deer and let them loose all over all the states. And get these deer younger, bigger, and let's have fun. I mean, it's like, might as well let the steroids back in the MLB, right? I mean, why not? I really liked seeing Sammy Sosa and McGuire hit. What would they hit? 93? Home 73. Runs 73. 73 and 72 think, or yeah, something, something like that. Like that. But why not? Why not let them get jacked and why not let them hit them all out of the park? Why not have two-year-olds that are 160 inches? So one of our topics topics discussed at Deer Camp or with your buddies is, would you shoot a 160-inch four-year-old if you claim to be an old, an old matured whitetail killer like myself, but I would shoot Dave if he came running by. Number one is because Dave's 160 inches, and number two is Dave's going to run around to all the other farms and disappear like the deer we call Big Baby. So Big Baby was a deer at 125 inches uh, as a two-year-old that just kept growing. And last year, he was pushing 160s too. And he was a four-year-old. And we could. this is a deer that we really thought could be something super special, 190, 200-inch typical deer, like a like world record style. Like he was, he had it. And he had it from a little baby. And he just... He didn't blow up like Dave, but he was on his way and he disappeared. Like we're still hoping he, you know, got shacked up with a doe somewhere and we never saw him the rest of the season, but he was here till pretty, he, he was even here after gun season. Yep. First gun season. So Thanksgiving, he disappeared. He disappeared. Yep. Now we did have a 10 year old white tail that, I'll, that Kirk actually shot and I was chasing and ended up killing him in December but you would have thought he would have showed back up. We had a nine and a half year old, eight and a half year old deer cowboy that was here too, that could have run him off Two other older deer that were running around. Like these deer could have ran this big deer off, but you know, that's a four year old that man, I, I honestly don't know how you didn't kill him. Cause when we had the talk, I was like, oh, you can kill him if you want, because he's going to run around and he's going to die anyways. Like there's this certain deer, you know, that are big enough that they're just going to walk around as a four year old and die. And Big Baby and Dave are those two deer. So I think I think you're going, to, going after deer, correct? Uh, going after Dave, right? Yeah, we're going to try to get Dave. So Dave should be hopefully hanging from the gambrels. And uh, in the barn this coming week, it's looking good. Old Don, old Big Don Higgins, real world, killed his big old giant eight-pointer. I told you guys to get out there and be the trail camera. Don, I don't know the story yet. He hasn't put anything out, but he killed that big old... Old deer, he's like six, seven years old. He's a homebody. He knew he'd kill him. It's just a matter of that just tells you don't worry about this 70-degree weather. You just got to have these consistent winds. And it literally was talking to my friend going, Don's going to have that deer dead in four days. 
And this was just a couple of days ago. And I was like, we, we're getting consistent wins. So I know I keep talking about this over and over, but as long as the winds are consistent, you can kill deer, any deer, anywhere. Just make sure the winds are consistent. Light the fire out in front of your house and, and things like that. Um, but really, I think that comes down to, uh, you know, the weather events that are coming, and that is rain. Uh, we've got four or five days of rain coming, and I got on my Facebook uh, today, and I just told everybody, Listen, if the winds are consistent and you're getting ready for the rut, the peak time when you're going to take off work and you're going to hit the woods and you're going to do all this stuff, right now you're getting a gift from God that for the next three, four, five days you're going to have rain. You're going to have warm temperatures. You're going to have off winds. So the warm temperatures are going to keep the deer at a very low movement, but not a, not, not a, not a time where they don't show up even like Kirk had a big deer come out within that last hour. The rain's going to let you get in and sneak around. Also, the crops that are coming off, corn can still be combined even if the fields are a little wet. So as you get it, as these guys get in the fields and they get these corn, this, this corn harvested, you're going to be able to use that as well as a big cover, like a big disturbance in the, the force and in the area. And this rain is coming, and this rain is going to be something where you can throw all your, your trail cameras that you need to get out or the extra ones you just bought. You can throw them in a backpack, put on your rain gear, and hit the woods. Um, also, with the rain, I, I'm such an advocate of don't wait. Like, this stuff should all be out um, – this stuff should all be out laying tree stands, clothing, straps, ratchet straps, decoys, anything that you're going to take to the timber, take to the woods. That's where you're going to really want to put this stuff outside in your yard, behind the barn, uh, in the grass, in the leaves, and let this rain wash everything off, right? And then I was even telling guys today that they – if they're coming home, getting off work and they've got, they don't have any extra time during the middle of the day because they got Saturday, they're getting ready for Saturday because they're going to be off work. Grab your buddy, put the stand in the truck and go in even in the dark. Like I've went in at night because we saw a big deer do something and go out to feed out into these fields. And I've drove my truck right in there, left it running, went into the tree, got the stand hung in the tree trimmed whatever we could and and literally got out of there and then crept in there the next morning or ha at least had the stand set that we could, you know, not have to go in there during the day when the deer could see what we're doing. They really don't care about these diesels and these trucks and these four wheelers and stuff at night. They just, they just don't care at night. It's their world at night. So if you have to, don't do anything dangerous, but to grab these stands, go with your buddy, big headlamps, do all this stuff, get in there, set a stand, set a blind at night if you have to. Even if you have to take all this stuff in and get it by the tree at night and then sneak in there and hang it when you're getting ready to hunt, right? Right. I mean, yep. I just don't think people think about that stuff, and it's just the tricks of the trade that we've done for years, whether it be that we had to kill six, seven big giant deer a year for TV and keep producing. We had to think outside the box because that was our living. Chris, some of those things that, uh, you know, you are so used to doing uh, because, you know, people like yourself, people that do this for a living, do this day in and day out. And a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, uh, you know, like myself, a guy from Pennsylvania, you know, may not know those things, you know, those little, little things that you do. So, you know, what are some of those there's things that, you know, that you do every day that, that are just come, you've come accustomed to doing, you know, kind of the one oh one. Yeah. The one oh one of of deer hunting that maybe a lot of people don't know. Uh, so, so with, so with bucks or just like deer in general, you think? Well, uh, cause what, know. what you've always told me is, is that you, I start talking to you about, the moisture in the air holding scent because the molecules hold and you're just like, dude, I don't think anybody even thinks about that. <laughs> they, they looked on their weather app and they went like, oh, we've got a south wind tonight. We're going to go hunt this one. And I think south's good. Uh, 
I see a lot of times with uh, some of the some of the whitetail planners and some of the other guys that do consults. Um, I think they could do it better, and that was the most polite way I, I could say that. Uh, I think they could do it better. They'll take a food plot in the middle of a of a field, and they think, okay, these deer are going to come to this field. They have to eat. This is where they're going to come to. They think it's more like elk, like elk go out to a pasture when they come off the mountain and they go out, right? These bigger animals and these deer don't necessarily go out to the fields. Do you go to the grocery store? Because I don't go to the grocery <laughs> store. My wife goes to the grocery store. And like we will go together and we will go have a special fun guy trip or buy steaks. And I think we bought ribs for this week and we bought fun stuff, but we don't go to that grocery store every day. Right. And so I think this is kind of where you're getting is, is I think the general public believes, okay, I've got a food plot. I've got a field. I've got a cornfield. I've got a soybean field. Those deer are going to come to that field. No, they're not. They, they're actually going to dig a hole. The deer that are like four five, six, seven, eight, they're almost going to dig a hole and they're just not coming out of it on certain days that barometer is not right that weather is not cold enough they're just they're big and they're getting ready for the party what why do they want to get up and go and i think the you get these doe groups you get these you know doe and her two fawns or her triplets and her last year you know fawns and does and you know they're got, got this little family group and they're they're up and they're going to go socialize and they're going to go out to these fields. So if you're white, if you're deer hunting, know that those are the groups that you're hunting. If you're hunting after these bigger bucks, man, they've walked to that field a million times and nothing good ever really came from that for them. Mm. Why? If they could pick a 24 hour period, why would they come during the day? They wouldn't. What if, if you and I could have our wives go to the grocery store and get our stuff for us and we could just do our manly things, why would we go to the grocery store? Right, right. We're not going. But if you tell me there is a there is a buy one, get one free on Cherry Coke and they're giving away free baby back ribs and it's only once a year, I'm probably going to check it out, right? Like it might be in the middle of the day when I would think nobody else would be there. Like you have to understand that there is just a little – strategy to these these bigger animals as well and if you look at that time schedule that we're talking about that 365 days a year they they just get a little anxious mm. and if they survive if they don't get killed if they live on a property like us that are managing this place and they just don't really don't leave and we didn't mess with them on this whole kind of 150 acre parcel side of this farm this deer didn't get hunted he's just doing his innate urges which is he's got food he's got girls and he never comes out there and eats he's hanging in a spot where he's browsing he's eating acorns he's watering down at the creek and so when he comes up and out and and starts the flow where he comes out of the crp he goes to the clover he goes to the alfalfa he heads out to the cornfields they play all night long in the fields all night long right these are in the bigger fields going to the two and three hundred acre fields and then in the morning, he's going to come back. Well, he's going to probably be the fastest one back, right? But what I think people need to understand with that is they don't do that till a certain time of year. Kansas has been open since 1st of September. These deer aren't getting up, heading to the staging area, clover plots, CRP, scraping areas, heading out to what I call the hard crops, corn, beans, whether they're food plots or farmers. They're not heading to these big fields. And they're not flowing out into them until you hit 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 30th, and then into sweet November. 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, these guys are just kind of checking stuff out, man. They're just kind of creeping around they're being creeps right i mean that's really what it comes down to is guys if you've been hunting and you've been hunting these big deer yes if you see some giants fall on camera but there's a lot more to that story when i say camera i'm talking about on social media out there getting taken their picture of there's a lot more that goes to that story 
they were not just rolling dice and they were not throwing a dart at a map. They weren't doing that. They knew where this deer was. They knew him with a, in a hundred yards. And most of the guys that you've seen killed a big deer, they knew where that deer was. They were hunting a small area that it doesn't happen every year. It doesn't happen every couple of years, but that deer was showing himself doing something that he, he was going to mess up. And the guys were able to go in and kill him. And guys like me, if I was hunting three or four or five states, one of them, the odds were one of them would be in that favor and I would slip in there and I'd kill that deer. And then you get a big picture and then mo most people want to hit the woods right then. I don't hunt mornings in October, but I'll promise you Saturday I'll be in the woods in the morning. Saturday is going to be the full moon. They're going to be rocking. But you have to realize what I'm just saying right there. 25th, 26th, this is when these deer hit what the world would like to call pre-run. And really all it is is just this anticipation phase where these bucks really are just kind of getting on their feet and they're wanting to go just get a little froggy. They're just wanting to go creeping around. They're like, hey, dear, if you're going to the store, I'll go to the store too. I heard that there was some baby back ribs on sale, right? Like they're just creeping. I mean, that's really all they're doing. And I think that if I was to talk to somebody that was just starting – I know Pennsylvania doesn't have a lot of fields and a lot of spots and a lot of it's big timber, but look what, look what I'm saying, guys. Even talking about the timber, even the guys out west, there are certain time periods where deer get creepy and they start doing really cool deer stuff. Because at the end of the day, deer, deer do deer stuff. This is the funniest part that Kirk always says. I still remember, you just make, make sure they have an area to do deer stuff and, and we just hunt the edges. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you've got a spot where they're doing deer stuff, they're going to get more creepy and they're going to start coming more toward the line that you've made on this little line where the wind blows from their area to you. And if you keep doing that sooner or later, the deer will start doing more deer stuff and cooler, creepier deer stuff, the closer to you and the closer when that moon is right, the weather trumps all things. If that temperature's dropping and that barometer's rising, they're going to do creepier deer stuff and they're going to do cooler deer stuff. And that means that they're going to walk around more, which if they walk around more, they're going to be closer to your kill zone. As long as they are doing kill zone stuff, they're going to die. And they do kill zone stuff and get in and do creepy deer stuff in your zone. The colder it gets, the higher the barometer gets. And the more that you're playing this perfect wind scenario. And like, so to me, that's it. And if you go, okay, well, I don't understand wind. Like, okay, well, the best thing I can do is tell you, type in on Amazon, smoke bombs. And we, we just looked them up this week to kind of maybe do something on Instagram or something fun. But just light one of the, your kids' smoke bombs and throw it in the yard and watch that smoke. It, it runs for 60 seconds. Just watch what it does. Does it drift completely out of the yard and go out of the yard, run into one side? Or does it go halfway, then dissipate, then stay there, and then drift up? If it's doing that, you, then you need to know more about what the wind's doing. Yeah, and I think that's something that's something I've learned from you. that, uh, And I don't think a lot of people realize how important the wind is to you yeah. and, and, and how you react to it. And I've seen you completely do a 180 and say hey we're going to go over here tonight and you watch the the wind for 15 minutes and it swirls around he said no this isn't going to work just one suck or one like blow a different way or whatever like one little twinch and it was like i can just imagine us waiting all year to get in a tree creeping into this perfect spot knowing that these deer are going to be on their feet knowing we're going to see a good one if we're there with the right wind if there was no wind at all and it was going straight up perfect scenario doesn't do that often but if you were sitting there take wind or scent out of out of, out of the whole equation we know 80 90 100 percent of the time a giant's going to show up in front of us i can tell you five times this week that that's going to happen right but that's just not reality because we have this thing called a finicky wind especially when when october you know when it's the month of october and so i don't understand i don't know if people understand the depth of that and so if i ever gave one person uh hey i want to be a deer hunter hey i want to be um somebody that really understands to be a woodsman out there and i want to see a lot more deer and i never want them to spook and the number one thing i can tell you is wind 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 
wind, wind. It's the number one thing. And, and the best way I can tell you to find that out is either a smoke bomb or to light a fire. And you're going to hear me say that often because we do it about every day. Today, we watched the Miscantis blow out of the southeast. And every, every place we went, it was consistent flags, everything, the whole way we're driving. Once you get obsessed with this smoke and this wind and you're understanding it, everything that you look at, every flag you look at, every smoke stack coming out of the the coal the the coal burning plants every everything you see you're going to watch the leaves dance across the all of a sudden you're like oh, did the did the leaves in the yard twirl or spin or go back like you're going to start watching that and i promise you when you get to that point you're going to start seeing an use a big word exponentially <laughs> a bit a, a big jump in your whitetail sightings just yes. in the whitetail sightings. Yep. And once you do that, and I don't, I don't and, and sometimes I think if your goal is to kill a three year old, I think you're going to pass up 20 does before you get a shot at it. Sometimes 40, sometimes 50. And if you can outsmart 20 deer, man, your odds go up of seeing a mature deer. I think if you outsmart 50 deer, it's going to go up so much more to see that one big buck. So if you're going into the game, not to just deer hunt, but to fool like like you're a little kid playing with hiding from your brother. Like <laughs> like you're like you're just a little kid. If you're looking at deer hunting like that and you're saying, How many deer can I fool? How many deer can I see? How many deer can I fool? How many deer can I see? How many deer can I fool? Oh, there's a five year old and you just killed your biggest buck. And if you look at deer hunting like that, not from the aspect of, well, I'm going to go deer hunting. I'm going to go to one of my bad spots today because it doesn't have any big ones. It doesn't have any big ones because you don't hunt it right because you treat it like it's a, you know, you treat it like it's a, it's a nothing. It's my, it's my worst farm. It's where I shoot does. No, nah, dude, it's because it doesn't have big bucks because you can't fool them there. You go there when it's bad. You leave your scent there. I think on another, on another frame of mind, is I don't think that I even have realized how often that I that I have run a buck off of an area. Like I can't think of one off the top of my head that I went into a food plot or into a stand or something and I had a five, six, seven year old whitetail smell me, like flat out see me. Like it's it's funny if they see me, I, I don't care about that. If a big giant deer, and big giant deer may be a three year old. I know one time it was for me a big giant deer was a three year old deer. If a three year old whitetail smells me, you have to go somewhere else on that farm to kill that deer. In in my opinion, in in my personal opinion, I can't remember the last time. And I, I'm going to use a four-year-old nolder. A four-year-old nolder deer smelled me just flat out, <sniffs> big old whiff. And I killed him in that same spot. Mm. Now, if they see me, even if I'm hanging like a monkey out of a tree, and they <sniffs> blow and they're out of there and they stomp and they white flag me and they go. If I'm walking into, let's say, the kill plot and walking down that narrow corridor and that bad boy is out there with those turkeys and, and he sees me and he bails off, that dude will be back there that night on the cameras. But, boy, if one smells you and that wind is swirly, I, I really think that you're done. You have to adjust your plan and you have to figure out how to flank him somehow and reset the trap to kill him. You may have to kill him during gun season because he may give you 100 yards, but he's not giving you 50 again. Right. And I think that that's one of the biggest deals uh, when it comes to the wind stuff too. Um, is that kind of what you were talking about? about yeah, like yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I, I've watched you, and I'm sure some the people that have watched you in the past – see you in a flannel shirt sometimes. Yeah. And uh, maybe don't realize that <laughs> you don't go. I mean, you're not spraying yourself down. Nope. Uh, very often that I've seen, you're not uh, having the latest and greatest clothing. You're going out there in a flannel shirt and your your gray pants 
and and hunting because you are so sure that your wind is good yeah we've got them beat it's so bulletproof and if you see me wearing the scent lock stuff and whatever that i was with for like seven years i don't even talk to those guys anymore but most of these suits and stuff that i designed at scent lock back in the day like i designed them i took my favorite i took under armor stuff in there i took all this different clothes clothing that fit really good like these sleeves this cuff i took them in there and we actually made suits fear no evil suits and so I still wear that clothing. And then uh, if I'm going to blinds or if I'm creeping in or whatever, man, I'm wearing my Costco stretchy pants, <laughs> my $17 Costco stretchy pants that look like QU, but they're from Costco. And uh, I'll slip in there and go in there. W one thing that I'm always wearing is you'll always see me wearing my green rubber boots. I'm a big one on the boot traffic. I'm a big one on your feet. Um and I'm a big one on how you get in, not walking their trails and uh, stuff brushing up against me. But yeah, man, I've gone seasons where, you know, we've hunted 200 days uh, in a fall, you know, starting in August and uh, never washing my clothes. Not one time. Never one time all season washing my clothes. Not one time putting them in the dryer to activate the charcoal. Never washing them why because i believed that the dirt that build up and the blood and whatever it's not uh, all all the uv stuff that was in there was really kind of washing off and i believed that the dirtier they got the better they were and then the scent just really didn't matter if if they're getting downwind to me you're you're done so yeah yeah and, and that's where you see me right like i'll just right. It doesn't matter what we do. Yeah. If I want to go smoke down in the front yard, like stand in the smoke while we're watching which way the smoke's going to go and deciding which, and that, that's something to get into, guys. You're going to hear me talk about that a lot. Like I just told you a little bit ago, light a fire in your front yard, play with your kids before you go. They'll think it's a fun little activity. Watch that smoke. Throw a couple logs on the fire. Watch that smoke. Stand in it. Let it get on your clothes and, and go out there. But every deer on the planet smelled smoke. It's natural. It's... uh. It's a good cover scent, man. You know, another really good cover scent while we're on it is if you're going to be flirting with your footsteps and stuff being close to deer, diesel fuel. <laughs> Rick Ham swears by it. Rick Ham, old duck killing Rick Ham, Snow Goose, Mr. Snow Goose. Uh, he swears by good diesel uh, cover scent. <laughs> and if you think about it, every tractor, every truck that's out there in the, all, all these farmer's trucks, They've smelled it their whole life. They've refilled the tank. They probably smell deaf at this point, you know? Like, if you're going to use something for a cover scent, boys and girls, in the next two weeks, step in some diesel fuel on your on your uh, old galoshes on your boots there and walk in, and you watch what that deer's reaction is. I bet he don't give two dangs about what where you stepped because of that diesel fuel. I'll bet you money. We should do an experiment. <laughs> Diesel fuel, let's diesel fuel our, our, our shoes, boys and girls. Um, and uh, what were you saying? What were you talking about? What, what did you ask me? You were uh, saying just how the clothing that I wear. Yep. And and then how particular you were when you came out here. Like you had the scent closets. You had the ozones. And listen, I'll talk about ozone one other time. But, you know, that's an unstable oxygen three molecule. The O3 oxygen three molecule will adhere to any any molecule and then overpower it it is true science it works the ozone stuff works i don't know about breathing it i don't know about having it encapsulated in your blinds but it truly beats human odor uh all of them as long as it's an unstable oxygen three molecule the sodium benzenol which is baking soda and then you you have uh all these scent killers like they work better be using it on your decoy but if you want to make something just as good, you just take baking soda, right? Arm and Hammer, like baking mm -hmm. soda. Yep. Yeah, you just take that and you put that in water and make a big tub. And that that's all this stuff really is. Sodium benzenol, I believe is what it's called. Uh, and so, you know, you can make some cheap stuff and soak all your stuff in it and let it air dry on the back porch and put it, in, put it on. And there you go. I guess put some diesel fuel on your feet and just walk on in. They don't even care. Uh, if you can find a nice big cow turd, I, that works really well for your boots. 
and carry one around with you if you go if you want. Uh, one of my favorite scents ever to have as like a cover scent was Fall Essence of Fall, and it was a alcohol based leaves like breaking down. Yeah, I remember that, dude. Where where is that right now? Who has that company? Because let's bring it back. It was sent away or something. Let's bring it back. It felt like you were laying in leaves. I think it was like a guy out of PA that was making it out of his barn or something, man. But the essence of fall, like it would take me back to when I was fifteen, sixteen, and I would just dump it all over myself. Like it, I I loved that stuff. So if anybody has any essence of fall out there, uh, send her my way. It's probably twenty years old if you do have it, but. Um, and we had like we had like a couple other little things to talk about, man. Like, uh, uh, what do you have on your on your mind over there? Well, one of the things I uh, somebody said here the other day is, you know, how do you get out of your stand? How do you get out of your stand when you know that there's deer around you? There's deer in the field. Uh, do you wait? Do you wait till it's dark? Can they not see after dark? Do you make noises? You know, what do you do? Well, I think the biggest thing I think people have to realize is, is that night and day are two completely different things to a white-tailed deer. Like, I think it's like that to humans too, but if it if the sun goes down, that deer really doesn't care about you. I mean, there's a reason why they get hit by cars all the time and the deer in the headlights and whatever. If those deer are in the field and you get out of your stand and you're walking out, if it was the daytime, they would be gone. And they'd freak out. And if you're walking and, and the, you still have the wind, they don't really know how far away you are. Are you danger or are you not? If you're not 50 yards and under, they really don't care. If they're 100 yards and they're out in the feed, field feeding, they're like, if they saw a coyote, they wouldn't freak. So if the boogeyman gets out of a tree and he's creeping along the edge, uh, just be on a mission. Like they just, I think most of the time, if they don't smell you, like you're good. Like it all goes back to that that smell like you know they talk about being traumatized in war and explosions and fires and stuff and that you know that's really what traumatizes most of us it's not sight it's really mostly smell that has to do with it i think the same things with whitetails if you're getting out of that tree the one thing i like to do is i will fully commit sometimes scaring my friends if they're hunting with me I will fully commit to being a coyote screaming as loud as I can, like a coyote. I'm not going to do it here because I might scare somebody, but just literally like as, as loud as you can, you want to shock them that you're 50, 60, 70 yards from them in a tree. And listen, I'm not talking about as soon as the shooting time's over at six 30 or whatever it was today, just start howling like an idiot. If you can, uh, kind of put off being an idiot for like a half hour. Just text your wife, text your buddies. Hey, I'm good. I just got to sit here for a while. Most of the times those deer will do the flow. They'll be out there further. If you're 15, 20, 30 minutes after dark, those deer are going to let their guards down. They're going to be real chill and be out there fighting and doing stupid stuff. And by that time you can kind of creep down. Um, but I'm a big fan of just coyote, barking dog barking uh in states where it's legal you can pull out your phone you know if the if you have a real problem with it I, in these states that are legal for electronic devices and stuff i think you can turn on a little bluetooth speaker and get a good youtube uh coyote call going and people would just it, it would work great it's not that they're scared of them it's said that that they're not as comfortable Right. And so uh, we talked about that. Uh, so that's my favorite way to get out. Uh, of course, if you have a nice friend or a wife that can get in a car or a, or a golf cart or a buggy or whatever you want to have, if they can drive into the field and keep the truck running and you can just get out enough to distract and bring the attention to a car or something coming into the field, number one way to get out, distract it with some, something else, tractor, buggy i don't care if you pull off the road and walk out into the field and let the kids run in the field they're associating that with the road right whatever you can get to get your attention off that tree you're really just trying to protect your location it's not necessarily that that's my opinion um 
And one of the one of the things you were talking about is the prediction after the full moon. I yep. hear, hear me talk about the full moon Saturday. It's going to be absolute fire. I push all my chips in and uh, bet it all and hunt and have a great day. I'm going to have a great day no matter what hunting. Uh, but uh, we we should we should have a big one on the ground. I I really I really believe the 28th is uh, the great first day of starting. Uh, let's say. Um, our deer season, our deer camp. Um, But after the full moon, I'm really kind of torn with kind of my predictions here because November one and two and three and four are some of my favorite days on the, in the deer woods. I've hunted a lot of uh, October 30th, uh, 31st, and I've never killed a deer on Halloween. I've seen a lot of big deer and kind of begins kind of the big chase and with some of these big older deer they've kind of narrowed down you know uh jane and and uh doe fonda and all these girls are running around and and they've really narrowed them down and they're like you i know you're the first one to come in and i'm going to protect you and they kind of just kind of stay on them a little bit i've seen that happen on the 30th and 31st i've never had a big deer walk into a if I'm, if I'm going to go hunt, I'm, and this is me like talking to myself right now as I'm thinking, I've never had a big deer walk onto a food plot the 30th or 31st. Mm. The does are normally scared crapless. By then, by getting chased at night, especially at these full moons, right? Yep. And, and, and on, you know, they've kind of 25th, 26th, 27th all night long, kind of getting chased a little bit. By the 30th and 31st, they're fat. They don't need to eat, so they're not coming to the food plot. And I'm talking to myself, like, I'm not going to hunt a food plot. In my head, don't hunt the food plot. Hunt the CRP. Hunt the edges. Hunt the hunt the thickets. By then, the does are running and hiding because they're not ready, and these bucks are really amped up. That's what I think is going to happen. I think the timing of when they move is really going to be weird, dictated kind of by the does. I would kind of start just kind of getting it on the edge of those little bitty thickets and Hunt, still hunting those scrapes because I think they're going to run around the does a little bit and then they're going to just hit these scrapes and you know, all of a sudden you're going to look up and some giant idiot's going to walk out of this grass and hit this scrape and go back in. Um, and then the first and second, man, you just hunt like you dreamed. Just hunt like you dreamed. Just be the trail camera. You've known the good spots that they like to be during the rut, boys and girls. And the rut is going to be starting. So sweet November, just hunt the places you know, and uh, and you're you're going to have success. You, you you already know where to go. I think everybody just needs a reminder of confidence. Like if you know where that big deer is, play that wind, get in there, hunt good, be the trail camera, and uh, I think it's going to be great. But remember, the rain's coming. Get out there, put your stands up, put your cameras in, use the rain, sneak around the woods. Uh, do all that. Hopefully we hit on some stuff. Uh, I know we got a little, a little, little round in a circle, but it's kind of the way it gets kind of the way I, uh, I process in my brain. So why not share with you? <laughs> uh, I just go over and over and over and over to this stuff in my brain. And, and, uh, I believe anything worth hearing once. And l- if you're really trying to learn, you might as well hear it 12 times. Th- that's me talking to me, right? Mm-hmm. I just play it over and over and over and over. And, uh, that's the only way you get good at something, I think. And, you know, my my tail has been all over this country hunting white tails, and I, I absolutely love them. But I really like the response that we're getting from everybody listening to these podcasts. Uh, they're pretty inspired and pretty fired up to go with new eyes out to the field. New eyes, um, new visions of how you approach some of these situations and how you're approaching deer hunting, even with your family and Christ as uh, the center and you boys that are, you know, kind of falling off the wagon with uh, be, feeling close to Christ and knowing that men are, uh, you know, men are vulnerable too. And uh, knowing that what a great time, there's no better time than being out there in God's creation. And so many guys I talk to go, I'm going to go where I'm closest to God out in the, out in the woods. And I'm going to sit there and, you know, 15 foot taller is just closer to heaven. Okay. Whatever. That's great. (laughs) Just do your praying. (laughs) Know that Jesus Christ is your savior. And if you don't know now your knees will bow one day, I'm telling you right now. Um, 
I'm going to talk about deer right here, but know that uh, Jesus Christ is my Savior. And the mountain that was put in front of me in this road of my little life and these seasons that turned my beard white and, uh, you know, I got in trouble for things I love and uh, tell that story one day, but understand that I didn't move that mountain. Uh, my Savior, Jesus Christ, and my and my Creator, Yahweh, did. And so the gospel is the only way. Um, it doesn't matter to me if you're, if you're chasing around uh you know, uh, holding snakes, uh, Pentecostal style, yelling, talking in tongues, or you just know carrying around a, a King James version or the the what what one do you listen to? You listen to the ha- you you read the Happy Bible. What's the Happy Bible? The message. The message. He's got the message. I'm somewhere in between with a, a English Standard version. It doesn't matter, boys and girls, about any of this about any of this stuff. Just know that. Just, just find Jesus. Hit your, hit your knees, and while you're out there hunting, while you're out there praying for a big buck, pray that uh, that your soul is right with Him, and just know that uh, that he, He's the only way. He's the truth, the light, then, and that's what's up. And uh, you're gonna you're gonna find yourself wishing for, uh, uh, you're, you're gonna change you're gonna change your heart's desire. Uh, you may want that big buck, but you're gonna find different messages in uh, in that that sacrifice and that search for him so anyways uh, reach out to us about anything a uh, big thanks to herman brothers um realty that's where i work uh they're made this possible for for right now big thanks to Berto brothers for uh helping me out when i needed it and um yeah tune in to us every day on social media follow us give us a follow instagram at uh, chris brackets land life and Chris Brackett's Land Life at Facebook. And you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, right now, Spotify and Apple. Uh, got anything to say, Kirk? Nope. I'm good. Okay. Shoot them in the chest. Remember, aim at the back of their lungs, man. You're going to find them. Put a big, uh, it's a lot easier to get through the back of them lungs where the liver is and find them than it is to uh, shoot them in the shoulder. Don't do it. Aim back a little bit. Go to the center, center of the white tail, and then go creep toward the shoulder and let her eat. And remember, the front end of that deer duck. So aim just a little lower than you think. And I, I'm going to start preaching this here. Listen, if you don't see the deer fall, give it six hours. It'll get septic if you hit it back. And if you double lunged it, it'll be dead in six hours. Don't go get your arrow. If you're close enough to your house, go back, spend time with your family, go in six hours later, go look for your arrow six hours later. If you didn't see it fall, go look for your arrow six hours later. You're going to find that deer 200 yards laying dead. This is just my advice. I talk to myself about it all the time because I'm all the time because I'm nuts. I'll see you guys later. It's the rut. We're getting up in the morning, going to do some more tweaking, getting ready in the rain, putting up some more cameras, moving around. And uh, we will be hunting tomorrow afternoon. Looking forward to this weekend. Thanks, everybody. I'm Chris Brackett. Peace out. All right, there you go. Good. Yeah, first 25 minutes.